The road to temptation is paved through questioning God's Word. Amen. Have you ever had an embarrassing moment? You just had one. That's exactly right. The president just had one. Amen. Uh, Mr. President, I am appalled that Dr. Pruitt would do that to you. It is shocking. Uh, but I remember my most embarrassing moment. I was in high school. I was a sophomore. Tom Bean High School, public high school in Texas. We were playing Sadler South Maiden basketball. I was on the varsity basketball team, and uh, we went to Sadler South Maid. They were the home team. We were the visitors. We had just finished warming up. <clears throat> I had on a jersey, uh, warm-up top, warm-up bottoms, some shorts, and an athletic supporter. The coach said, all right, guys, uh, Starters, go take off your warm-ups. I went over there. I began removing my warm-ups. I took off my warm-up bottom, I mean my top. I began removing my warm-up bottoms, and unbeknownst to me, I had forgotten to tie my shorts. Also unbeknownst to me, I grabbed my shorts as I grabbed my warm-up bottoms. The home crowd was behind me, and we're the visitors. I began to pull my warm-up bottoms and shorts down. It got to about right here, and I felt a breeze between my legs. I thought, well, that's just because I'm taking my warm-ups off. I got down to here, and I realized my shorts were around my ankles. Pulled them up as quick as I could. It's too late. I just mooned the home crowd. The rest of that game, they'd say, shoot it, Mooney, shoot it, Mooney. Now, I did score 26 points, uh, so I guess you could say I was on a streak. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, incredibly, incredibly embarrassing. Whenever you're embarrassed, whenever you're ashamed, it's probably the worst feeling you can feel. We say things like, I could have crawled under a rock, or I could have died. It's an incredibly horrible feeling. Can you imagine standing before the Almighty, standing before the Alpha, the beginning, the Omega, the end, existence himself, and being ashamed of your life? Adam and Eve understood that feeling. They felt it very clearly in Genesis chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. We're going to look at some truths from Scripture today, from Genesis 3. And I want you to notice, first of all, man's temptation. Verse 1 of Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Has God really said? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The road to temptation is paved through questioning God's word. Has God really said? In tempting man to question God's word, the serpent placed doubt in man's mind about the authority of God's word. When we speak of the authority of God's word, what we're speaking God's Word is more authoritative than anything in my life. God's Word is more authoritative than my mind. God's Word is more authoritative than reason. God's Word is more authoritative than my experience. God's Word is more authoritative than my senses. God's Word is authoritative. So that when my mind differs from God's Word, God's Word is true, not my mind. When my senses differ from God's Word, God's Word is true, not my senses. When my feelings differ from God's Word, God's Word is true, not my senses. See, you and I can err. But if God is who He says He is, He cannot err, and thus His Word cannot err. And here the serpent comes and he begins questioning God's Word, and he causes man to question God's Word, and thus... Doubt God's authority. There are at least three ways to question the authority of God's Word. Number one, to know what it says and to openly rebel anyway. Thou shalt not lie. 
I know that's what it says. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. I question the authority, the validity of God's word by the way I live my life. The second way to question God's word is to allow temptation and sin to actually skew our understanding of God's word. Thou shalt not lie. I know God says thou shalt not lie, but he really didn't mean that. Here's what he meant. We skew the meaning of God's word. The third way to question the authority of God's word is to simply be ignorant of it. I didn't know God said thou shalt not lie. All three of these lead to sin, and that still happens today. Did God really say not to lie? Did God really say not to steal? my classmates homework and lie by calling it my own did God really say to be sexually pure did God really say to love my enemies did God really say to humble myself it's so easy for us to begin questioning God's Word especially when we don't know it in fact I've heard it said from a lot of Baptists lately, did God really say not to drink alcohol? And I can't find it in Scripture. What I, what I see in Scripture is that we can't get drunk. I don't see anything about not drinking. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Well, what about Jeremiah 31? Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat, for wine, for oil, for the young of the flocks and of the herd. And their souls shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Dr. Reynolds, it appears in those two verses that there's some conflict. Appears in Proverbs 1, God has something negative to say about alcohol. But it appears in Jeremiah that God has something positive to say about alcohol. In one sense, God says, hey, you know, I ought not do that. In another sense, God says, hey, take and enjoy. Uh, Dr. Reynolds, uh, I'm a little bit confused. Well, let me ask you this question. You think God's conflicted? Do you think God's confused on the matter? Do you think one day God says, hey, don't do it. And the next day God says, hey, enjoy. I mean, do you really believe that God is confused on the rightness of it? If you don't believe that, then something else is going on. There was a time when Southern Baptists knew the Bible. And as such, we understood that the Hebrew word for wine, yayin, had different meanings. The Hebrew word for wine could mean grape juice and oftentimes did. The Hebrew word for wine could also mean wine that was diluted so much by water that literally it would pass through you before you could get drunk on it. And the Hebrew word for wine could also mean intoxicating drink, mind-altering drug that would kill brain cells. If that's true, would it not make sense that when we read the negative words of God about wine that he's probably referring to a mind-altering drug that kills brain cells seems to make sense to me but when we see the positive then perhaps he's speaking of fruit of the vine the grape juice the joy that comes from therein so Dr. Reynolds do you really think we can do that let me kind of illustrate it this way let's say 300 years from now the English language is a dead language. Let's say someone's interpreting the English language and they come across a diary and they're interpreting the diary. And it's a diary of an American who lived from, say, 1940 to 2010. And in 1955, in the diary, they read, Today was a bad day. My dog died. My girlfriend broke up with me. I broke my arm. It was a bad day. And then they keep reading and they get to 1985 in this same diary written by this same individual and he says, today was a bad day. Uh, the beach was beautiful. 
The stakes were totally radical. It was truly awesome. It was a bad day. You see, even within the English language, words have meanings based on context, and at times they can have contradictory meanings. That's why you and I need to know our Bibles. It'll keep us from making ignorant statements like this. Anyway, Jesus shows up at the wedding and begins his public ministry. God has come to earth, and he kicks things off as a bartender. Or, after I entered the ministry as a man of legal drinking age, the drum was again repeatedly beaten for me by well-meaning older pastors. So I never drank alcohol until I was 30 years of age. About that time, I was studying the scriptures for a sermon about Jesus' first miracle of turning water into wine, as reported in John's Gospel, a miracle that Jesus performed when he was about my age. My Bible study convicted me of my abstinence from alcohol, my sin of abstinence. So in repentance, I drank a hard cider over lunch with our worship pastor. Studying God's word keeps you from making statements that are as ignorant as these. These comments were written by the founder and lead visionary of a group called Acts 29. The questioning of God's word is very, very subtle. When there are some of us within the Southern Baptist Convention who are struggling with our North American Mission Board because they give money to help plant churches that partner with Acts 29, there's a reason we struggle with that. It comes down for us to the authority of God's word. Southern Baptists for a long time, for our history in fact, have given over 50 resolutions stating clearly, as we understand God's word, alcohol is a drink and it is wrong for recreational purposes. And yet we're going to partner with someone who disagrees with who we are? Listen to me. I, I don't have anything against Acts 29. I think that's great. But let them be Acts 29. Don't use Southern Baptist monies to help start churches. I would no more want to use Southern Baptist monies to help start Presbyterian churches than Acts 29 churches. The reason is God's word is authoritative. And as we understand it as Southern Baptists, we've come to this understanding through the study of God's word. The questioning of God's word continues on when we seem to make God's word in some parts, more authoritative than other parts. As if authoritative had degrees. Well, some truths are primary. Some truths are secondary. Some truths are tertiary. This statement strikes at the heart of the authority of God's Word. Either truth from God's Word is authoritative or it is not. We should never fall into the trap of, I lied today, but I didn't murder, so I'm okay. Or, I know I was immoral sexually, but at least I didn't rape anyone, so it must be okay. Sin is sin, and God's Word is authoritative, no matter what categories we might devise. What God's Word teaches on baptism is as authoritative as what God's Word teaches on salvation. And what God's Word teaches on alcohol is as authoritative as what God's Word teaches on abortion. My advice to you as young Christians, know your Bible and obey your Bible. If you've never heard the famous sermon by Dr. Jerry Vines, a Baptist and his Bible, you ought to go on and listen to it. It was preached in the heat of the debate over the authority of God's Word. And Dr. Jerry Vines took Billy Baptist and he walked through Billy Baptist's life and he showed how Billy Baptist trusted God's Word. Know God's Word and trust God's Word. Eve 
question God's word. Jesus quoted God's word. The origin here in Genesis 3 of sin is questioning God's word. And questioning God's word leads to questioning God's goodness. Did you see it there in verse 2? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Eve's quoting God. Eve says to the serpent, here's what God says, we shall eat of the trees of the garden. That's not what God said. Go back to Genesis 2. God said you may freely eat of any tree. Isn't it interesting that Eve left out the two words that spoke about the freedom God gives us in our lives? You can freely eat any tree. Eve leaves out those words. Not only does she leave out words that express God's goodness, she adds words to it. Go back to Genesis 2. God didn't say you can't touch it. God said you can't eat of it. Nowhere did God say, hey, you can't touch it. Eve comes to the devil and he says, you know, God did say we can only eat some trees. And, and he said we can't even touch it. God must be a mean God. God doesn't want me to have fun. He set up these rules because he's not good. He doesn't want me to have fun. In man's relationship with God up to this point, the covenant name of God has been used of man's relationship with God. Lord God. Now Eve, when she's speaking to the serpent, she leaves out the covenant name of God. Up to this point in the Genesis narrative, in man's relationship with God, there's that covenant, Lord God. But here, as she begins questioning the goodness of God, she questions the covenant of God. She leaves out the Lord God. You ever wondered if God's good? God set up all these rules, Dr. Reynolds, and I really think God just doesn't want me to have fun. I think God doesn't want me to enjoy life. I think God doesn't want me to enjoy living. See, Dr. Reynolds, sin is fun. Yes, you're right. Any minister who says that sin isn't fun is a liar. Sin is fun for a season. Many of you have often heard me say sin is like chocolate-covered cyanide. Tastes good, but it'll kill you. Sin is fun for a season, but sin will also destroy that spiritual life, that spiritual vitality within us. Let me ask you a question. I've got a little five-year-old boy at home. His name's Kelton. Let me ask you this question. Am I being mean? Am I being ungood when I say, Kelton, don't play in the street? I mean, I've set up these rules. I've set up these parameters. I've said, Kelton, don't you go out in the street and play. Am I mean by saying that? Am I mean by setting up some rules? No, I would argue that I know things my little boy doesn't know. And because I know things that he doesn't know, although he may think I'm being mean, although he may think I'm not being good, in actuality I am protecting him so that he can have fun under the protection of my care. God isn't mean when he sets up thou shalt and thou shalt not. God is good. He loves you. He knows things that you don't know. Jesus put it this way. Which of you, if you had a father and you come to your father and say, Hey, Dad, I'm a little bit hungry. Would you give me some bread? Which of you's father is going to pick up a rock and say, Hey, son, munch down on the rock? Or if you have a father and you go to your father and say, Hey, Dad, I'd sure like some flounder today. Could you give me some fish? He's going to pick up a cobra and say, Munch down on the snake, son. And then Jesus made this statement. If you being sinful or if you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more so your Father in heaven? You see, when God sets up these parameters, these thou shalt and these shalt, thou shalt not, what he's doing is he's protecting you. A lot of you have been hurt, and I mean really hurt. I understand. I've been hurt in my life. 
And a lot of times when we get hurt, we wonder, God, what are you doing? Where are you? Are you good? I can relate. As I stood over the grave of my 20-week-old baby boy up in Sussex County, Virginia, and led a funeral service, I can relate in saying, God, where are you? Why did you let this happen? But at the end of the day, I would say as the psalmist, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God is good. We start down this path of sin when we begin questioning God's word and when we question God's word inevitably we start questioning God's goodness God is always good I want you to notice not only man's temptation but man's transgression verse 6 so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise she took of its fruit and ate she also gave to her husband with her and he ate they sinned and now notice the consequences then the eyes of both of them were opened they knew that they were naked they sewed fig leaves together made themselves coverings the first thing we see when man transgresses, one of the results is man tries to fix it. I've sinned. The outward evidence of this sin is their nakedness. So let's cover it. Let's fix it ourselves. It's interesting up to this point in the Genesis narrative, the only one who's made things is God. Day one, God made. Day two, God made. Day three, God made. Day four, God made. Day five, God made. Day six, God made. Day seven, God rested. Since day six, we're, told, we're not told that anything else was made. God had made everything man needed. God gave everything that man needed. But now, when man sinned, man made. It's almost as if God says, or it's almost as if man says, God, I don't need you. I got this one covered. I'll fix it myself. God, I don't really need to repent of this sin. God, I don't need to get things right. God, I don't need you. I've got it handled. God, leave me alone. God, go somewhere else. I don't need you. And we fill our lives with parties and we fill our lives with uh, friends and we fill our lives with games and we do everything we can to not get to that moment of being alone and being quiet. Because in those moments of being alone and being quiet, we ultimately realize we've deceived ourselves and we really do need God because there's an emptiness inside and no amount of pleasure, no amount of possessions, no amount of popularity, no amount of power can fill that God-sized void. Only God can fill it. And we reach that point and we realize we're empty. And those of us today who are running from God, you'll do everything in your life to not get still, not get quiet. Because when you get at those moments, that self-deception reveals itself and you realize I'm still empty. Adam says to God, I don't need you, I'll fix it myself. Oh, Moses, as he was penning these words, must have laughed as Adam fixed it with leaves. <laughs> Going to cover a naked body with leaves. The word for covering there is a Hebrew word. It's used other times in the Old Testament for a belt. I'm going to make myself a belt of leaves. How totally inadequate this was. Tried to fix it, but he couldn't. Not only did he desire to fix it himself, but also he was separated from God. Verse 8. 
And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. Adam remembers what God said. In a day that you shall eat of that, you shall surely die. I ate it. Here comes God. Oops, die. Let's hide. Not only were they ashamed to stand in the presence of God, but I believe there was a fear because they knew that although they were already spiritually separated from God, they were hiding themselves from God, there was a fear because they knew they would also face physical death in that day that they ate. Anytime you and I sin, it separates us from God. We don't feel comfortable in the presence of God. In fact, if you're in sin today and God's speaking to you, you might be pulling your phone out and texting. You might be turning to someone next to you and whispering. Because when the Holy Spirit comes in and starts speaking to you about your sin, you run. You do whatever you can to get away from that presence of God. Because sin separates us from our loving Creator. Man was running and man was hiding. But I want you to notice not only man's temptation, man's transgression, but the beauty of this passage, God's redemption. Verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God covenant, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. We're not told exactly how this took place. I like to use my imagination. Looking at the sacrificial system of the Old Testament and the way that God worked and looking even to the New Testament when John the Baptist would look at Christ and say, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of man. I like to imagine that perhaps on that day after God confronted Adam and Eve, He had them sit down. He went and got one of their pets. Maybe it was a little lamb. Perhaps He brought that little lamb in front of Adam and Eve and looking forward to the sacrificial system and even the New Testament, perhaps God said, Adam, your sin of disobedience be transferred to this little lamb. wonder what Adam thought if God pulled out a heavenly knife at that time. And for the first time since earth had been created, God took that knife and began to cut that little lamb's throat and blood trickled to the ground. I wonder what Adam thought when he saw the first sight of blood. And then as God finished cutting that little lamb's thought, throat, I wonder what Adam thought when that little lamb perhaps collapsed to the ground in death. I wonder if Adam thought, I was supposed to die today. I wonder if Adam thought, God said in the day that you partake of it, you shall surely die. Oh, but I didn't die. No, it was an innocent little lamb. It didn't do anything wrong. It, it had just lived in perfect harmony the way God created. But my sin was transferred to that little lamb. And that little lamb died for me. Make no mistake about it, Genesis 3 points very clearly to the cross. You and I, we've all sinned. Anyone who says, who says they don't sin, they're sinning by making that statement. We all sin. We all do things that are wrong. And the Bible teaches that God can't be in the presence of sin. He is, as it were, allergic to sin. I can't go to heaven. I can't be with God. My presence would stain heaven. My evil would stain the presence of God. I can't be there. I must go to a place called hell. 
The Bible teaches that while we were yet sinners, Christ died in our place. He experienced an eternity of hell in six hours. Only God can experience an eternity in a finite amount of time. He died for man's sin. Only man could die for man's sin. Thus the God-man Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. I have a strong inclination that there's a lot of individuals here today who think they're saved because they believe Jesus rose from the dead. Did you ever stop and think the devil believes that? The demons believe that. They believe that Jesus is God. They believe he died on the cross for man's sin. They believe he rose from the dead. That doesn't make one saved. Mere intellectual belief doesn't make one saved. It's believing it so much that you trust your life. I will not do what I want to do. God, you are good. I trust your word, I trust your goodness. And so when you tell me what to do, I will obey you. That's the difference in salvation. Trusting God so much with your life that you live it the way He wants you to live it. If there were any doubt about this pointing to the cross where Jesus would die for our sins, Notice the words again that Moses used. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made. It's the first time that God has made anything since day six. Day one, God made. Day two, God made. Day three, God made. Day four, God made. Day five, God made. Day six, God made. Day seven, God rested. And God's been enjoying this rest with Adam all the way until Adam sinned until Adam disrupted things, until Adam perverted and twisted God's creation. And then God went back to work. Theologians refer to Christology in two parts. The person of Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, and the work. Jesus came back to do the work to cover man's sins, to provide an atonement, to provide a covering for our sins so that we could go to heaven. That's why on the cross, Jesus cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished. And he wasn't talking about the cross. He was talking about the work. He was talking about where we as man had twisted and perverted God's creation. And God came back to earth and God went back to work and he died on the cross and he said, it's finished. I've taken care of it. It's fixed. You trust me. You go to heaven. You trust me. Your life's taken care of. You can't fix it. I can fix it. It's done. I'm going to ask us to bow our heads and close our eyes. I'm going to come down and try to kind of get on level with you. And I'm going to speak to faculty, staff, myself, and students. And I'm just going to say, quite frankly, we all can worship God more. It is a great salvation. And we ought not take it for granted. And I want to say to those who are here today, I can honestly say in a transparency before my God, we love you. We want what's best for you. These chapel services aren't to try and indoctrinate you or anything like that. They're simply a plea to make sure you're going to heaven. and Make sure you're in a right relationship with God. And if you're here today and the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about salvation, about truly trusting your life in God's hands. In just a moment, some of the staff and faculty will be standing up here. I want to invite you, get that settled. Walk out of here today with the redemption of Jesus Christ. 
you're here today and you're like me and there's been times in your life when you've questioned God's word and even questioned God's goodness, and right now there's some things in your life that you're doing whereby you're questioning God's word, don't walk out of here separated from God still. God did a work. He made a covering. Come today. Be reunited with your Father. Enjoy that relationship. If you're here today and you know someone that you've been praying for that's not saved, there's nothing wrong with during this time just walking up to them and saying, I'm still praying for you. I love you. If you're here today and you just want to praise God, I want to give you the freedom to worship God as you chose so choose. I'm going to pray for you, and after I pray, musicians are going to lead us in a song of worship. The altar will be open for you to respond however God leads you. If you need to talk to someone, there'll be someone here. But I just want to invite you to enjoy the freedom of getting right with God, of worshiping God the way that God made us to do. Let me pray for you.